Hello and welcome to the lecture 2 of course Microelectronics Lab. In this theory module we are going to talk about electrical characterization and probe station theory. Broadly we will be talking about uh, a quick introduction of electrical characterization. We will talk about electrical probe stations, um, electrical measurement units like source measurement unit SMUs. Uh, we will discuss in detail different electrical cables, connectors and how they uh, work and how do you integrate all of them. We will also talk about high power and low power measurements. Uh, subsequently, we will talk about CV measurements, hall measurements and then how to use these measurements for different kind of parameter extraction and analysis. So, uh, let us first look into the an overview of basic electrical characterization. So, what are the major components required for electrical characterization? They are the device under test, which is the device that we want to characterize electrically. We require a power supply to supply the voltage or current. Then we require an ammeter which measures the current. And then we require connecting cables. So, this is an example of a, of a very basic electrical measurement um, setup wherein we have a power supply. Then we have an ammeter. So, this power supply supplies the voltage. Then we have an ammeter which measures the current. And then we have connecting cables through which the power supply cables and the device under test, which is the resistor in this case, is measured. So, now that we know how a basic electrical characterization or a basic electrical measurement is done, so we have some very important questions which we need to solve as part of the, of the module that we are covering. Number one, can this basic measurement technique that I had discussed be used for measuring any semiconductor device? Number two, why are electrical measurements important and how do we measure or how do we go about doing electrical measurements especially for semiconductor devices. So, in this respect let us first look into an on wafer indicated device or a chip where well, this is a silicon wafer and if we if we zoom into the silicon wafer we have a number of dies and in each of these dies we have many many transistors one of them being as shown here. So, these transistors are are, do have lengths in the scale of nanometers and the pitch might be in a few microns and we can have in a square millimeter of dye as high as 100 million transistors. So, while we were talking about measuring a resistor which is something that we can see through our naked eyes, what we are, what the problem in hand here is that we, we have millions of transistors and hence we need special arrangement to measure them. And in this module, we will try to understand how do we go about measuring such semiconductor devices. So, now let us first look into why do we need to do semiconductor device electrical measurements. So, it is because of two basic needs or purpose. Number one is a device perspective and number two is a materials perspective. From the device perspective, because we want our device to meet some specific power requirements, we need to operate a particular voltage, have a particular current. So, we need to see if whatever we have fabricated meets those specifications. Number two, again, if we have fabricated a device, we need to see if the device operates as it is supposed to over the complete range. The only way we can ensure that is by measuring it. And then once we have fabricated a device, we need the device to operate without failing for a specific range and for a specific time. So, we need to investigate the reliability of these devices. While this covers the device perspective of electrical measurements, the material perspective is that we would fabricate our devices on a particular material, say silicon, say gallium nitride, etc. So, we need to now from the science part of it try to understand that what, what leads to the reliability challenges, why does it fail? how good the sample is, the purity of the sample, the material uniformity. So, we have both a device perspective and a physics perspective which we can cover by doing electrical measurements. So, this is a basic IDVD and IDVG characteristics that are electrical measurements of a transistor which we intend to measure in this module. Okay, so uh, we are talking about uh, our electrical measurement system. 
So what are the components of these electrical measurement system? So if we are talking about a discrete device, say a resistor versus an on wafer chip, which I was talking about. So, so for device dimensions, discrete devices are at least centimeters. On, however, on, on wafer devices, the, the dimension is in microns. So if we are talking about a measurement setup, it can be very simple for discrete as already discussed. However, it can be really sophisticated for on wafer, which will be covered here. Number two, uh, then do we require a stage on which we keep the wafer or the device? We do not require it for discrete. We use a breadboard or a PCB and then we measure it. However, we need special arrangement of a stage, chuck and vacuum to hold the wafer here. Next, what are the cables that can be used? Normal copper cables that we use even in our, in our home can use, be used for measuring these devices. However, we need special triax or coax cables. Do we require an optics? No, because if since it's a discrete device, we can see it with our naked eyes. It's not the case on for on wafer devices. We require microscope and lamp arrangement to see the device. Now for actual measurement, we need probing of the device. So we do not require any special connectors. We do it through breadboard or PCB, but we require a special arrangement of probes with micro positioners. For the power supply and current sensing, we just require a DC supply and ammeter and voltmeter, basic things that we always do. However, for on wafer measurements, we require special purpose SMUs or current sensors. And it requires this measurement of discrete devices does not require any extra accessories. However, we require a number of things like, like isolation tables, cameras, vacuum pump, dark box, probe tick, etc. for on wafer device measurements. So now that we understand that we require such a such a complicated setup for on wafer measurements, the the next part of the of this lecture would deal with looking into each one of them with greater detail by trying to and trying to solve the problems and do a on wafer measurement at least on the theory part. For actual measurement, we have we will do a demonstration of measuring on wafer devices via probing, which will be covered in the sub module of demonstration. Okay, so now that we know that for on wafer electrical measurement, there are a number of challenges involved. So what are the components for these on wafer electrical measurement? So we've talked about a special station, which is called a probe station, which we see here, wherein we keep our device and probe it. We'll go into greater details in just a short while. Number two, what we had for the power supply, we require SMUs, which is a source measure unit. And number three, we need connectors and cables to connect these SMUs. This is the back or the rear side of the SMU from the rear side of the SMU to the to the device via these probes, micro positioners. So now that we know the basic components which were required, which are required for electrical characterization, we'll look into each one of them in some greater details. So let's first look into electrical probe station. These are images of multitudes of probe stations which have which are available and developed over time. So this is a modern probe station which which is which shows a num a, a very complex setup. However, these are some of the old designs of probe station. However, the basic principle of their operation is the same. We would be covering electrical probe station and probing in very great details during probing. However, I'll look through or go through all the parts uh, of an electrical probe station in as part of this uh, theory module. So what are the components of the probe station? Number one is the space. So everything on the probe station is mounted on this space. It's usually cast with aluminium and it's a solid plate or may it also be a breadboard. Number two, we require a stage, which is this. The zoomed in image is the stage. So we require, we are operating with devices which are, which have sizes in microns. So we need very, very fine motions and we also require X, Y and Z motions. So this is to, these are knobs which are used for rotating or moving the wafer in X, Y and Z motion. How do we actually do it is going to be covered when we are actually doing a tool demonstration. So 
So the, this is the stage of a manual probe station wherein we have a vacuum chuck. This is to load the sample. We have knobs which are used to move the chuck up or down. Then we have a chuck up or down lever. We have adjustment of chuck up and down. Then we also have the stage X and Y motions. So this is the chuck. It's a flat metal surface. It holds the wafer securely and we have we have holes here which is for vacuum so so this vacuum holds the holds the wafer in place so that we can probe the device without without damaging our devices so besides this chuck is also application specific we require for high power for high frequency for therm we can also have thermal chucks so we we have special chucks to meet special application demands okay so now we uh, have a platen which is this stage all the manipulators are placed on this platen and this platen can also be adjusted in the z direction from by moving the platen up or down okay while all of that that i had covered is part of basically the stage how where to put the micro positioners and the and the and the sample holder However, as mentioned, we need an arrangement to see the devices. So that's a microscope. So first we require a microscope mount, which is this. So that this microscope mount provides X, Y and Z motion of this microscope. Now for the optics of the microscope, we can have a stereo zoom microscope, which is a low cost microscope, but it can only do basic probing for sizes of beyond 50 micron by 50 micron pans. However, for seeing very, very small devices, which is generally the case, we, we require a compound microscope, which is a, which is a complex arrangement of a number of objectives and eyepieces, such that it can operate a, at, a, at a magnification as high as might be 2x, 2000x. We also require light sources, we, then we have an option of the microscopes, and it operates with better resolution, but comes at a higher cost. Okay. Another very important uh, part of probing is the manipulators, which are referred to as micro positioners. So it is used to position the probes on the device under test. It sits on the platen and uses magnets or vacuum so that it does not move during measurement. And it gives X, Y and Z motion so that the tip that is loaded here or the tip that you see here moves in micron ranges such that it can move as close to the to the to the metal pad in the device as possible and then it comes down and probes the device so we will do an actual probing of the device in the tool demonstration module so this is the this is a, uh, the basic block diagram of the manipulators assem assembly we have the probe then we have a top block, we have a middle block, we have a bottom block, and then we have a magnet. Now each one of them moves in one of the one of the other direction. That's how we 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 move the micro positioners in micron scales. So the top block it, it gives y direction, middle block gives x direction, the magnet holds the micro positioners, and the rotating arm gives the z direction. Okay. So that now we have a micro positioners. I had talked about tips. So what are probe tips? So they are needles that make contact with the with the device under test in order to measure and in order to pump in voltage or current and measure. So they are mostly made with tungsten or you can also be have made with stainless steel, etc. And what is so specific about the probe tips is that the, the tip diameter can be very, very thin. It can be in microns. It can be even l around 5 microns to at as high as 100 micron to 200 micron. So depending on the specific, on the, on the application that we require, we take different probes, uh, tips. So this is an image of a probe tip. So which is, uh, this is a real uh, die each one of them being a die and we have a number of devices so this is a this is a diode that we can see here and the tips that we see here are tungsten tips which when seen through the microscope looks like this I, li I like to point out that these features are in microns this is around a 20 micron 
by 20 micron pads and these are tips which can be as small as 5 microns. So by moving these tips to the specific positions to the cathode and the anode we can probe the device and make electrical connections and measure this diode unlike what we have done using a breadboard or a PCB for a, for a, for a discrete device. While we had talked a lot about the basic uh, how do we prove the device at least from the from the from the perspective of what are the parts that make it another part or another very important consideration in, in probe station is to to make the measurements noise free one of them is a shielding box so this is a faraday cage it is a dark or it's a black colored metal box which which provides uh, Faraday shielding or it provides shielding to electromagnetic radiations from from outside such that measurements because we are talking about highly sensitive measurements we do not want electromagnetic radiations to to uh, damage or rather to to include noise in our measurements so hence we require shielding boxes and we have special feed throughs through which cables from the outside which is the SMU connects and from the inside we connect through cables to the to the device under test. Another very important thing is this vibration isolation table. Because we are, we have a lot of vibrations around. However, because we are talking about devices that are in microns, uh, even a very small vibration can, can put the tip, either scratch the pad or put the tip on, uh, move the tip outside our, our active region or our pads. So we require special tables so that it does not vibrate. So the table is uh, mostly on compressed air pistons which is used to decouple the ground and the table and uh, we need to maintain a, a constant pressure by using a compressor. So why do we require vibration isolation? So vibration disturbances, disturbances mostly are periodic or might also be non-periodic. So when frequency of the periodic force is equal to the natural frequency of the equipment it gets amplified which is governed by this equation so either we need to so we need this frequency of the natural frequency of the table to be as small as possible to isolate the ground vibrations to it, this can be reduced by either making the table very very heavy by increasing this mask or by using isolators so by changing the spring constant so because we cannot have a very heavy table we, we we play with the with the spring constant and hence we design vibration isolation tables so what are the kinds of isolators available one is a passive isolation which has damper mass and spring and it, it greatly reduces the ratio especially for for uh, disturbance frequency to isolation natural frequency which is in the ratio of root 2 however we we mostly want an active uh, vibration isolation such that whenever there is a vibration uh, it, it works uh, with a controller and then with sensors such that it mitigates it during measurement. So it, it is used to mitigate vibrations even for very low frequencies even 1 hertz. So a passive isolator with feedback loop example air spring that I have talked about is something that we regularly use. So we in our case mostly use active vibration isolation. Okay, so now that we have talked about probing the device etc, we were all talking about a manual probe station. We also have a semi-automatic probe station. A semi-automatic probe station is, uh, is uh, in this respect different from a manual probe station that where, whereas in manual probe station, the entire probing is done by hand and then each, each of the measurements, say we have 100 transistors, we have to probe the device 100 times. In semi-automatic probe station, we probe the device only once and then we, we prepare a, a, a file which gives location of the devices. We, we feed in the, the location map and then the, the system remembers and then the chuck moves automatically such that it probes. So again, how do we do a semi-automatic probe station is something that will be covered in greater details again in tool demonstration. So, so again, these are the parts of a, of a semi-automatic probe station. It's the same. We have the connection panel, wherein we, from where we take connectors to the probe to the manual uh, 
to the macro positioners or to the SMU. We can have a multitude of macro positioners. This in this case is an RF macro positioner. This is a DC macro positioner. Again, these are platen lifts. This is the chamber wherein we put the sample. This chamber, uh, uh, this is a chuck. This chuck moves and this chuck is controlled by this software which is seen here. Again, we have a microscope arrangement and the probe station control software. So for the cascade microtech uh, semi-automatic probe station that we house, we have a probe station is controlled by a software called Velox. So the sample is first kept on the chuck and lo loaded into the micro chamber. The die is then properly aligned such that there is no theta misalignment. And then on only first device, the probing is done. The coordinates of all the devices on that die are saved in a map and then subsequent dies are measured automatically and it can be used for measuring not just IV can also be used for measuring CV and RF measurements. The CV being done by the DC macro positioners and RF being done with the special RF macro positioners. Okay, so with this we come to the end of the, the probe station part of, our, of this module. And then we will look into the various measurement units which, uh, which are used for measuring these uh, devices. So, <clears throat> so now that we are looking into the electrical measurement uh, units, so what are the challenges and solutions for, for such a measurement? So, if we see the so the voltage and resistance versus resistance plot of measurement uh, equipments that are available so if we see different different uh, units like a nano voltmeter a digital multimeter and electrometer it it covers a, a a specific range and if we are operating at very low vol voltages then we cannot uh, operate at very high resistances because it's it's prohibited by noise so we cannot measure this dark region and it's almost near the theoretical limits and these are the ranges where we can easily measure and uh, as uh, mentioned that depending on the on the unit on the measurement unit that we take we have specific ranges so now looking into the electrical measurement instruments into in greater details we have a digital multimeter uh, then which is which is something that we all know which we have all used then we have electrometers so they have higher sensitivity and measurement capability than digital multimeters so they can be used as voltmeter ammeter ohmmeter coulombmeter we have nano voltmeters so the voltage measurement is near theoretical limits for low source resistances so it's it's actually an electrometer which is optimized for high source resistances then we can also have pico ammeters wherein it's it's low voltage burden speed and lower price in uh, micro electrometers then we can have micro ohmmeters which is optimized for low level resistance measurement and out of all the measurement instruments which is the main most important for us is a source measure unit which is which is referred to as smu it is a combination of both sourcing and measuring capabilities so it can source voltage and current as well as measure voltage and current so it works both as a power supply and an ammeter or voltmeter if we can talk about that in in the simplistic of terminologies so so it can it can source current and then it can measure v and it can source v and it can measure i which is seen in SMUs. However, if we are using a digital multimeter, we, we have a current source and we measure voltage. If it's an electrometer, we, we supply voltage and measure current. And using that, we can measure for a diode, we can either measure the forward characteristics or, or the reverse characteristics. So now let's let's compare the source measure units and a digital multimeter and power supply system. So I told, talked about why SMUs are important for electrical characteristics of, of semiconductor devices, whereas a digital multimeter and power supply is routinely used for, for uh, discrete devices. So one of the advantages of SMU over a, a DMM power supply is the four quadrant operation that is available in a in a SMU versus a two quadrant system which is 
used for a power supply. So SMU is capable of both sourcing and sinking power unlike the two quadrant operation of power supply. So it is it can be used to characterize almost everything. It can be used to characterize even batteries, solar cells, energy generating devices, etc. <clears throat> Number two, uh, what are the advantages of SMU over DMM with power supply then? Number one, the speed and precision. So for faster rise times and lower measurement uncertainty in SMUs, so it gives high speed and precision uh, over digital multimeters. Then it has a high uh, operating range and resolution, so it's, it is able to measure very low currents. It can even go to very high voltages as well as very high currents and very low voltages. So it gives, uh, it, it has a significant wider range as well as greater resolution than power supplies. And then it has a very good sweep capability. It offers very high sweep capabilities and it simplifies the programming tests as source, delay and measure characteristics and then helps to significantly increase the testing productivity. So we can do very fast measurements compared to a DMM with power supply kind of a setup. So this is an image of a, of a typical uh, Keithley SMU which we routinely use. This is a 2636B kind of a source measure unit which has two channels which is channel A and channel B. So each of the channel is one SMU. So this is two SMUs in one box. Each of these channels can be used to source sync voltages and currents. Okay, so what is a source measure unit then? So a source measure unit or a source uh, is a fixed combination of a voltage source which an ammeter in series and a current source with a voltmeter in parallel. And an important thing to note here is that it cannot uh, the source and measure cannot be separated. So it will both source and measure at the same time. So uh, uh, the, the characteristics of a transistor which can be measured using, uh, using a SMU is as seen in this picture. So how were source measure units developed? So it, it came as the prelude to source measure units was HP4145A which was made in 1982. It was capable to completely, of cap completely characterizing the DC characteristics using four independently controlled source monitor units. And Keithley 236 was the first standalone SMU in the picture that you can so, uh, see here, which came up in 1989. However, the present of source measure units, there are a plethora of SMUs available. There can be 2400 series, 2600 B series, it can be 2450, 2460 series, or it can be 2657, 2651 A series, which are high power SMUs, which we, we will look into some of these SMUs in greater details. So let's let's for example take the 2400 series SMUs which are available. So depending on the on the on the number of the SMU, we have different wattages. So a point to note: the wattage of an SMU is fixed. So based on the wattage, we will there is a trade-off between maximum voltage and maximum current that it can go. So so say for 22 watts to 66 watts to as high as 110 watts. So we can either measure high voltages or it can be to very high currents. Now then again, depending on if it's a DC measurement or a pulse measurement, what is the range that we can go over voltage and current is decided. So depending on the application domain that we want to use that we see here, we can take different uh, SMUs. While this is an example of 2400 series, we uh, routinely use 2600 series source units source measure units. These are similar to 2400 series but have a higher display resolution and improved connectivity which that is the reason why we we prefer 2600 series over 2400 series. That's why in our lab demonstration module we will mostly look into 2600 series of SMUs. So what are the SMU configurations that we have? There's, it's, there's a voltage source configuration that we see here. So it's a voltage source then there's a current meter and then there is a compliance so this this protects the device then there are four terminal terminals which is input output high sense high sense low and input output low so high and low are the other terminals which go into the device sense high and sense low keep this thought we will go into details of what sense high and sense low does and then there's a feedback depending on the voltmeter measurement here which senses the voltage that is across the device then it gives the input to the voltage source and accordingly the voltage is set. 
So, in this configuration, the SMU is low impedance voltage source and when the voltage is zero, the SMU is working as a ammeter. Then there is a current source configuration. In current source configuration, SMU is a high impedance current source. Again, we have a current source current meter. Here there is a, because it is a current source, there is a, there is a limit on the voltage compliance and then when the, the current is zero, the SMU is working as a voltmeter again the same four terminals which is input output high, sense high, sense low and input or output low. So this is a block diagram of a 4200 SMU which is again, so I will not get into greater details of, of uh, what exactly is inside. However, we I need to again focus on the point that we again have force which is sense high and then there is a low, this is the common and then there is a sense high and sense low again the four terminals which come out which is seen here so this is the the again the similar kind of a, a kind of an arrangement that we have for four sense sense low and common and from if we want to measure a diode from high and low we have the diodes connected and just before the the device we also take terminals to the sense high and sense low port why do we do it it will be covered shortly so now, now let's look into why is SMU measurement so so critical, and what are some of the very important things that we need to need to take care of. Number one is shielding. So uh, we want to reduce electromagnetic interference because we are talking about signals which are very very low. We are talking about measuring currents or uh, in in pico amperes maybe even lower. We need to measure very low voltages, nanovolts, microvolts. So we cannot have uh, have in electromagnetic interferences. One thing that I had already mentioned is we are using a Faraday cage, but we also need the cables to be shielded. So this is why we require shields because if we are unshielded, this is the kind of noises that we have versus the shielded. So we can see that while we can measure uh, a very, very, uh, I'd say, a uh, noise free measurement in using a shielded cable, we, we cannot do the same uh, for both a shielded cable as well as uh, the, the, the SMU should also be shielded. So now that we know that uh, cables and connectors are so critical, let's, let's quickly look into some of the cables and connectors. So there's a plethora of cables and connectors that are available. However, we mostly work with triacs and coax. So this is how the, the cables look like. I like to point out that uh, the difference between a triax and coax, which I will cover uh, in details just after this uh, introduction to these cables, I like to point out that how do we find out if it is a triax and coax. It is a coax, so it has got two notches. So if the connector has two notches, we can say that it is a, it's a coax. On the other hand, if it is a triax, there are three notches, one, two and three. So seeing the three notches, we can refer to this cable as a triax. So what are coax and triax? So this is the center conductor. So this is which connect conducts the electricity. However, as said that we need to shield it. So because we need to need to shield the, the connect cable, so we require an, a shield, which is a Faraday cage here. And then because it's a, it's a Faraday cage, it's a Faraday, uh, it's a Faraday cage, so we require the insulator as well. Uh, so, and then, like we have always got an insulator on the outside, we have an outer jacket. And the triax cable, on the other hand, has the same center conductor insulator and inner shield, but also has another insulator and outer shield. So, how does it help it? Because there's an extra added uh, safety feature of uh, then another Faraday cage, it results in even lower noises. So if you are to measure very low currents or very low voltages, the way to go about is to measure a, using a triax cable. So this is what I had mentioned that in a coax there are two notches versus a triax where we have three notches. Okay, so how are then the guarding in SMU done? So if it's a coax, the problem here is that because there is a there is a uh, insulator which still has some resistance values because there is a resistance there is a current that is going to flow through this loop and hence the current that we measure is going to be uh, higher than the device and the test current 
and hence there would be there would be measurement errors in a in a coax connector on the other hand for a triax these two are kept at the same potential so there is no current that flows in this loop if there is no current flowing through this loop then we do not have enough current flowing through this loop either hence the current that is actually measured is the current that goes through the dot so hence a guarded circuit with triax cable is always the best method to measure at least very low currents because we cannot tolerate even errors in the range of il okay so now that we uh, know of a probe station smus and cable and connectors let's look into some of the measurement techniques one of them and the most important is a two wire and a four wire measurement so if it's a two wire measurement this is an smu and then this is a resistance under test so the device under test so because there is a cable there is going to be some resistances on the cable come whatever low value it might be but because there is a resistance when we are measuring the current there is significant drop in these resistances because of that the resistance that we measure is is an erroneous value and we uh, add the the lead resistances that we see here so there are going to be errors if we do a two wire measurement however if we go for four wire measurement the, the way to do is just before the device under test we uh, connect uh the 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 device under test again to the sense high and sense low terminals so this is a a, a high resistance uh, path however because we have the the connectors we have a similar resistance here as well but because there is almost ne negligible current that flows in here there is negligible drop in this loop so the voltage across the resistance is almost completely measured by this sense voltmeter so by this we now have a, the smu now knows that what is the actual voltage that is seen by the resistance under test versus what it has actually measured so there is a feedback loop by which we can get out of this erroneous zone and can measure the resistance under test perfectly so now that we have seen of the different measurement techniques now let's look into a low voltage and low current measurement so in uh, in low current measurement what are some of the issues and how do we solve it so because it's it's very low current even stray resistances path between measurement circuit and nearby voltage source is a resultant of leakage current and it degrades the accuracy of low current measurements so how do we solve it we use good quality insulators like teflon polyethylene or sapphire we reduce the humidity in of the test environment and then we use guards so as mentioned that because uh, in the guard we have the nearly the same potential and hence there is lesser uh, errors in the measurement so this is again a repeat of what i had already shown that how guarding in smu can help in reducing the or helps in low current measurements that's why i had mentioned that we would always use a triax connector when we are doing very low current or low very low voltage measurements then another issue in low current measurements is zero drift so there is a gradual change of the indicated zero offset even if there is no input signal so it produces an error by adding it to the input signal and then uh, it it there is normally as specified as a function of temperature and non time but the good part of it is that it it can be corrected another very important error in uh, low current measurement is generated currents so depending on the input bias or even insulator and cables there are currents that are generated in the system which adds to the desired current and causes errors so what are the generated currents so because of triboelectric effects because of mechanical stress effects because of electrochemical effects or resistor noise in one hertz bandwidth we have current generated from the range of fm to amperes to as high as tens of nano amperes so depending on what kind of a connector we have we'll have uh, different uh, currents that are that are uh, added to the system so when we are designing a low voltage low current measurement setup we need to be very careful about the kind of uh, cables that we are using the ambient that we have etc etc so i talked about the input bias current so which is the current that is generated within the system so it is because of the bias current that we add from the active devices that we use in the smu 
and it it besides it is also because of voltage offset drifts that happens due to temperature time etc so how do we do it we just measure this current without uh, the device and then we add or subtract the the input bias current from the measurement now for the external offset current while that the current was because of the the, the devices within the smu because of ionic con contamination or triboelectric effect the triboelectric effect is is when there is a twist in the in the in the cha in the uh, cable uh, mm -hmm. contamination humidity dielectric absorption there is going to be a offset current that sets up so how do we uh, uh, solve it we suppress it by using a suitably stable and quiet external source of the opposite polarity Uh, another very important uh, issue in low current measurement is ac interference and damping so this is uh, filtered by using a using a, a low pass filter circuit and it consists of a low leakage polystyrene polyester capacitor and a potentiometer and a damping circuit should also be built in the uh, shielded enclosure so these are some of the some of the error sources in low voltage uh, measurement they are thermoelectric emf internal offsets zero drift rf interference electromagnetic interference johnson noise uh, line cycle interference magnetic uh, field ground loops etc so the the take home from here is that we need to be very careful when we are uh, designing or measuring very low voltages and very low currents and then we need to choose the the cables the ambient etc etc so that the error can be minimized again the for the thermoelectric emf this is one of the most common errors in low voltage measurements so because different parts of the circuit are at different temperatures and they are from dissimilar materials so how so there is going to be a, a emf set so because of how do we solve it we use the same material for all conductors and then we minimize the temperature gradients uh, as to the bare minimum by using a good heat sink and a good thermal coupling etc and then uh, the solve how do we solve it we use reverse sources so we use two sources va and vb and then we have this vemf which is set so because we have two reverse sources so if we measure it so once it would be vemf plus va minus vb which is the voltage here and the other one will be vb minus va and then if we if we uh, add uh, subtract both of them we can calculate the the uh, uh, we can uh, get rid of the vmf so vemf or the emf thermoelectric thermoelectric emf is the algebraic sum of all thermoelectric emfs in the circuit except those in the connections between va and vb so we can get rid of a lot of a lot of noises and lot of errors by thermoelectric emf uh, for the 1 by f noise uh, there is nothing much that we can do except for the fact that we know that what is the amount of noise that will be incorporated depending on the frequency of operation we have and these are the electromagnetic interferences that that come in our devices so depending on where we are operating we need to need to get rid of each one of these noise sources so that we can uh, measure very good uh, device performance uh for the for the rfi or emi electromagnetic interferences so i had already talked about the shielding the faraday cage external filtering as as ways by which we can uh, reduce this noise again uh, johnson noise is is something which is going to be uh, always available due to thermal energy how do we do uh, get rid of it we lower the temperature of the source we decrease the bandwidth of measurement by increasing the response time of the instrument so 1 by f noise is maximum at low frequency and hence affects low low voltage measurements for line cycle because we are operating at 50 hertz or 60 hertz depending on the country uh, so if we are doing a smaller integration because it falls in different parts of this line cycle every time we are going to have some differences if we so how do we get about that we do a line cycle integration if we do a line cycle integration it averages out this noise for the magnetic field uh, it generates error voltages if field is changing with time and there is a relative motion between circuit and field how do we solve it so the leads must run close together magnetically shielded and tied down 
and we twist the leads together so that and then we this reduced area results in lower voltage induced and induced voltage in adjacent twists are of alternating polarity. However, most of these are resolved if we use a triax cable. Another very important uh, source of error is ground loop. If all the equipments are on separate grounds, then what might happen is that because there is going to be a current flow between them, there is going to be a drop. So how do we and, and be, because of that current flow and that drop, we are going to be significantly, uh, er, there will be significant error in the voltage or current measured, especially it, at low voltages or low current regimes. How do we do uh, get rid of that? One is to, to, to include a common mode impedance or uh, we can have all these sources connected to the same bus ground so that there are no loops. So we, we reduce the number of loops to as much as possible. So each one of these sources are connected directly to the ground port without creating a loop. So now that we know what are the challenges and how do we solve low voltage measurements and low current measurements, now let's quickly look into high power measurements and the challenges involved. So uh, for, for high power measurement, we require special, we have special devices. So number one is from the device perspective. So we have to have metal pads. The pad layout should be such that it can accommodate large device. Uh, the device metal pad should be thick to minimize the metal resistance and joule heating and thick layer around a micron or so must be deposited. So for the probing area, while for small current devices it's only 100 micron by 100 micron, say for large current devices it can be as high as 500 micron by 200 micron. So from the design perspective, we need to grow thicker metal, bigger pads. Okay, so another challenge is the cable. So we have been talking about coax or triax cables so triax cables are a strict no at high currents, especially because we have extra extra uh, shielding. So it is very bad at heat dissipation. It would burn the cable. Even low power coax are, are cannot handle uh, can handle a maximum pulse current of 10 amperes. So if we are expecting even larger power dissipation, we need specially constructed cables, which are high power coax cables and they consist of either air dielectric or Teflon to withstand high temperature. Besides, it's always advisable to perform four wire measurements in for high current because if it's higher current, given a constant resistance in the cable, there's going to be significant drop in the cable. And if there's a significant drop in the cable, the device under test is going to be seeing a very low voltage and hence we will see an underestimation of our characteristics. So in, in four wire measurement, we, the high current is carried by only force high and force low, which requires a high current coax. For sense high and sense low, conventional triax cables will be employed. Another thing to note for high power measurement is the probe tip. So conventionally probe tips have in the probe diameter in the range of 5 micron to 50 micron. However, because the surface is not going to be smooth, so the contact area is around 25% to 30% and 60% to 70% of the tip diameter at the toe and heel. So because only, first of all, it's only 5 micron and then only 30% of that is uh, uh, for actual contact, it produces a very constricted current flow which can result in current densities as high as 10 past 6 ampere per centimeter square. Such a high current flow over a, such a small uh, region or area will result in melting and electromigration and fail the device even though your device should have survived. So it's not a real device failure, it's a measurement related failure. So how do we go about doing that? We use multiple probe tips or micropositioners. So we require two wire and four wire uh, as I had already mentioned and we use high current or voltage probe tips and micropositioners. So these are thicker tips which is a, which can uh, conduct higher currents. So that's how we counter this high current density problem. Another thing that we need to do is that uh, during measurement because of the high temperature in a real uh, circuit we'll have uh, coolants or, or like we are going to have 
might be fans installed might be heat sinks installed but that is not the case when we are meshing the device on chip so there might be significant degradation of the device performance if you are doing if you are not talking about how to how to thermal manage the device so <coughs> so for due to channel mobility and degradation at elevated temperature the measured device on current is reduced if you are going for high power measurement and this is going to significantly change our real device performance so we need to use thermal chuck and need to cool down the device up to as high as minus 55 degrees celsius to mitigate above issues because without this we might actually fail the device so now that we know that what are the challenges involved now let's look at how do we do that we need special high power smus so what we had talked about in the first uh, half of this uh, module are, are medium power smus which can go till about some 200 odd volts however and uh, and at around a few amps of current so we require special designed smus to, to for the purpose of high power measurements so they are uh, these smus because we require high voltage or current we these are used for measuring diodes fest igbts etc and high power materials so we have an smu called high current smu which is 2651a the, the the advantage of this smu is that it can go to currents as high as 50 amperes and depending on the voltage of operation and if it's a pulsed measurement versus a dc measurement so so this is how we can see it so if for the range of 10 volts the dark blue that we see it is for dc measurement so for dc measurement within 10 uh, within plus minus 10 volts it can measure around uh, 20 amps of current in dc mode and if it's 40 volts then we can measure around 5 amperes of current but if we are going to pulse depending on the pulse width we can measure current over this entire regime of within plus minus 40 volts there is significantly higher currents that we can measure so this is a high current smu on the other hand if you're talking about a high voltage smu it can uh, go to as high as 3 kilo volt again because the power is a constant because we are going to very high voltages the current is limited okay so with this we come to the end of uh, IV characterization uh, we will now quickly look into uh, capacitance voltage measurements so so while we had talked a lot about IV measurements what is the purpose of CV measurement so it is one of the most fundamental measurement technique it is widely used in research lab for evaluating new materials, processes, devices and circuits and it is one of the most used technique for optimizing process and device performance. Besides, it is also used for reliability by reliability engineers to qualify material, monitor process parameters, analyzing failure analysis. And it is used to measure a wide uh, range of devices from MOSCAP, MOSFETs to 3.5 devices to solar cells to photodiodes even CNTs, graphene fets, etc, etc. What are the measurement technique technologies that are available? There are three basic CV measurement technologies. One is the classic AC impedance uh, capacitance meters. Then we have quasi-static capacitance measurements and we also have an RF technology which employs a vector network analyzer and RF probes. So let's first look into the AC impedance capacitance meter. This is specifically what we routinely use. It's, it's, it has a AC impedance meter which is a LCR meter so it measures complex impedances with an auto balanced bridge maintaining AC virtual ground at the sense side and these meters typically work from 1 kilohertz to 100 megahertz uh, sorry 10 megahertz and we have tools like the PCT CVU or 4200 which we have uh, which is used for capacitance measurement so how does it work so there is an ac source there is a dc supply which is by us and then there is a ac source which is used for measuring the capacitance then there is an ac voltmeter and an ac ammeter and then there are again four ports a high current high potential low potential low current these are two are shorted and connected to the device under test high these are connected to the device under test low and over this the ac voltmeter and using this ac Am ammeter we measure 
so we we supply an ac voltage out of the high current terminal h current the current through this device is measured by the low current terminal l current which is this ac uh, ammeter then voltage across the device is measured by the high and low potential terminals which are h port and l port so the voltage and current are measured in a phased locked manner so that precisely identifies the phase angle between them so by knowing the amplitude and phase angle so we calculate the desired ac impedance parameters so 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 we measure this z and theta so z and theta can be calculated from this r plus jx by we calculate so because we know both the both the amplitude and the phase so using this amplitude and the phase we are going to be able to measure all uh, the basic parameters for cap cv measurements now for th we can have two common ac impedance models that we can select we can either have the parallel model or we can have the series model so we can have the capacitance and resistance connected in series or capacitance and uh, conductance are connected in parallel based on that we can have four modes on which the cv measurement unit can work there are parallel capacitance conductance series capacitance conduct uh, resistance we have parallel capacitance and dissipation and series capacitance and dissipation factor so so depending on the device that we are measuring and what exactly do we want to measure we need to operate the tool in different modes so now that we have talked about uh, the ac impedance technique let's talk about quickly talk about the quasi static capacitance measurement technique so the measurement of current and uh, charge are used to calculate the capacitance value so this is from this is a current measurement technique again so a ramp rate method is used and it's very simple to use but it is only limited to a very small frequency range which is 10 1 to 10 hertz and it requires the use of two smus the first smu forces a constant current into one node of the device under test and also measures the voltage and the time on that node and simultaneously the second smu measures the current being uh, output from the devices other node and the capacitance can then be calculated using the simple equation i equals to c dv dt because both the voltage and time information is available and it is used to uh, for measuring capacitances in the range of 100 to 400 picofarads at a ramp rate of 0.1 to 1 volt per second so while this is used to measure a 1 to 10 hertz kind of a cv uh, the the ac lcr meter is used to measure capacitances from 1 kilohertz to 10 megahertz now we also have an rf technology based uh, cv measurement technique so uh, it is a technology of transmission lines uh it a vector network analyzer measures the scattering parameters which are reflection and transmission coefficients of the incident waves so what are the advantages the rf cv is the best choice for characterizing for ultra thin gate or leaky dielectrics and it is very good for modeling rf devices and correction techniques for rf probes are well understood and implemented however it's a it's a very expensive equipment it has expensive test structures and expensive rf probes and only works uh, near the 50 watt characteristic impedance of the uh, of the transmission line becomes inaccurate if it device is not close and it's too uh, complex hence the classic ac impedance measurement is one of the most preferred technique which is used worldwide for uh, capacitance voltage measurement so this is the typical measurement is in 4200 acs which we use so uh, we can have a cvu voltage sweep how does it do it soaks then it starts to a dc bias then it gives a ac signal depending on what voltage you have set and the frequency at which you want to measure the capacitance then there is a delay and then it measures then it goes to the next voltage depending on the step that you decide again uh, provides the ac signal measures and goes on so this is how a voltage is swept number 2 uh, how do we do a, a frequency sweep so we pre soak then we put in a particular voltage then we we uh, the ac signal is applied depending on a particular frequency measured then at the same voltage the frequency is varied again measured and then goes on for the number of uh, frequency ranges that we want to measure then it goes to the next voltage step and then redoes the same uh, frequency measurements goes on to the next uh, voltage step does the same measurement and so on 
So, using this uh, measurement technique, we can characterize the capacitance voltage of a MOS cap, MOSFET or any device for that matter. So, now let us look into the common CV measurement errors and uh, solutions. So, so uh, there are common errors. So, there is an error because of uh, higher gain, there might be offset, which however, while we want to measure this, not the nominal value, there might because of offsets, the value might be as here or because of gain, it might go to our overestimation. So, the way to do is, is to calibrate. So, we do open uh, correct short correction and load correction. So, with that we can measure uh, these values. So, by calibration while Z load is something that is very difficult to achieve Z short and Z open that is open uh, correction and short, corre short correction and open uh, correction is something that we routinely do so that we get rid of all the errors that are because of the cables and uh, the, the setup that we have designed. So, uh, we this, this uh, lists out uh, many of the common CV measurement errors and solutions. Uh, so, depending on what accuracy we require and what are the, the kinds of measurements that we are uh, working on, what are the sources of error that we feel, we, we have specific corrective action which are suggested which we need to follow to, to provide a CV characteristic which is as close to reality as possible. So, now that we have looked into IV and CV characterizations, let us now look into the Hall measurement technique. So, uh, we are all aware of the Hall effect. So, using Hall effect, we can determine whether a semiconductor is P-type or N-type and it is used to measure the carrier concentration and mobility. So, a uh, semiconductor with a current Ix has to be placed in a magnetic field B which is perpendicular to the current flow. So, because of the force on the particle that is the electron or the holes, so there is a there is a force the Lorentzian force that sets in. So, depending on if it is a P type semiconductor or an N type semiconductor either a positive voltage or a negative voltage is set up in and then we measure this. So, this induces an electric field. And in, in, so, in steady state, this magnetic field will be exactly balanced by the induced electric field. So, by this uh, induced Hall field and the voltage across the semiconductor, we can measure the Hall voltage. So, by measuring the Hall voltage and by assigning the sign of the Hall voltage for a P type semiconductor, we have the Hall voltage as positive. For N type semiconductor, we have the Hall voltage as negative and uh, from, from the calculated Hall voltage, we can uh, find out the, the concentration of holes and uh, electrons in the sample under test. So, uh, for while for n-type semiconductor, the mobility is as seen here, for n-type uh, semiconductor, the mobility. So, we can des decide the, the uh, the type of semiconductor, whether it is P-type or N-type, what is the concentration, what is the mobility of the carriers using the Hall effect. So, how do we measure it? So, we have a, a magnetic setup and then we place the uh, device perpendicular to the magnetic setup. The magnet is an electromagnet and then we can change the magnetic fields and then we measure the, we set in a current through the device and then we uh, measure the voltage and based on the equations as discussed, we can find out the mobility and concentration of the carriers in the semiconductor. So, with this we come to all the electrical characteristics me uh, characterization measurements. So, we have talked about IV characterization, CV characterization and Hall measurement. Now that we have uh, and using th this theory, we will be able to measure IV in a probe station which is covered as part of the demonstration. Once we get the data that we will be extracting, that we will be obtaining through our probe station and SMU and cable connectors which, which uh, as a whole will form the setup for, for making uh, our electrical measurement setup for uh, semiconductor devices. Once we get those data, we need to extract meaningful data out of it. So, this is the last sub module of this part wherein we will talk about the parameter extractions. 
So, so we have the SMUs that I was talking about and then uh, we have the mic the probe station wherein we keep our device so this is a uh, sample device so we have the drain source and gate now so if we have uh, so this is a 12 channel 2636b smu we can use multiple smus so from the high terminal of one smu it goes to the drain and the other terminal of another smu the high of that goes to the gate and both of them needs to be grounded the source needs to be grounded so drain and source is going to be one smu so this is how it's connected gate and source is another smu so gate is high source is low these two are internally connected so we need to have only one connection if they are not internally connected then both of them have to form a t and form a uh, loop so while, while one smu is the drain source smu the other is the gate source smu so now this is the two wire connection if it were a four wire connection then we need to also use the sense high sense low of both these smus so now with this connection we can measure id so we can also design similar connections for resistors for diodes etc once we have that uh, we can measure IDVD, IDVG characteristics. So these are some of the data that we can obtain from this measurement routine. This is IDVD characteristics or different VG. So from such a measurement, we can find out the maximum on current for a maximum VG that is applicable to the device. From the IDVG characteristics, we can find out the off state leakage and ion max for a particular VG and VD. From the gate leakage characteristics, the IGVG characteristics, we can find out the reverse gate leakage at a particular gate voltage. From the IDVD characteristics in the linear region, we can find out the on resistance of the device. Again, by, by uh, now once we have those values, we can write scripts and then using a differentiation function, we can find out the transconductance of the device. Similarly, by finding out the slope near the threshold voltage, we can find out the sub-threshold slope in the device. Again, from the IDVG characteristics by either linear extrapolation, which is as shown here, or by peak transconductance method, wherein at the, trans at the point where we have the peak transconductance, we draw a, a, a slope and then wherever it cuts the gate voltage, we can find out the threshold voltage of the device. So while these were parameters that need to be extracted for transistors, if we have a diode, we will have the forward characteristics of the diode or IDVD characteristics of the diode in, in, in forward bias. So from there, we can find out the R on in this regime, in almost this linear regime. Then we can also find out the maximum ion that we have for a diode. In the off state, we can find out the maximum reverse leakage current depending on the voltage range till which we want the diode to operate. And very close, we can also uh, to the to the zero volt condition, we have the off current of the diodes. Similarly, by by using this equation of short key barrier uh, height and fitting the curve that we obtain, we can also find out the short key barrier height of the of the of the diodes. Uh, the cut-in voltage by using a constant drain current method, we can find out the cut-in voltage of the diode, which is the voltage at a specific threshold diode current of 1 microamp per millimeter. And from using the capacitance voltage curve, we can use it to find out the interface trap density. Another technique uh, is to use a transfer length method. A transfer length method is to find out the contact resistance and sheet resistance. So we have metal or ohmic pads and the spacing between the pads is, is changed and uh, we find out the resistance between each of these pads. So this resistance is a, a is a total of the resistance because of these contacts and the resistance that is incorporated because of this size of, of this distance between the pads. So because this is known, the distance between the pads is known. So by, f by, by plotting this RT versus D and we get a linear curve, we can find out twice the contact resistance and the sheet resistance of the device. So with this, we come to the conclusion of the theory of electrical characterization and, uh, and uh, measurement setup, wherein we looked into probe stations, uh, SMUs, cables, connectors, then we had a brief overlook 
over low power and low voltage measurements, high power, high voltage uh, measurements. We also talked about uh, hall measurement. We then talked about two wire and four wire measurements. We briefly looked into capacitance voltage measurements also. And finally, we, we also uh, talk, talked about once we get measurements out of our real devices, how what parameters that we need uh, is it that we need to incorporate or we need to find out to have meaningful to give meaningful information to these measurements. Uh, so once with this, uh, I'd uh, like to thank you all for your patience hearing, patient hearing. Uh, and uh, in this next sub module, I'd be showing uh, a realistic demonstration using the components that is already discussed and finding out the IDVD characteristics or capturing these IDVD characteristics, IDVD characteristics, etc. of these devices under tests. Thank you.